I'm Doug Bescheroff from the University of Maryland School of Public Policy, and this is a joint event from the um, um, Friendship Heights Village Center, co-sponsored by the Maryland League of Women Voters and the Norman and Florence Brody Family Forum. We are delighted to have this opportunity to help provide at least a little bit of light about the issues that are facing Maryland voters this year. Uh, now for our second panel, the subject is the provision for uh, formerly called civil marriage protection in the state of Maryland, but more commonly known as the same-sex uh, marriage provision. Uh, let me remind you all the way the Maryland rules go, and then I'll introduce the panel. Uh, a vote in favor of the proposition supports the proposition. Um, a vote against would repeal um, yes, would repeal the state law. Uh, we're lucky to have two um, uh, very articulate advocates for the um, legislation. The first is Delegate Kathleen DeMai. Am I saying that correctly? Uh, Dumay. Dumay. Okay, my apologies. Well, I'm going to have to get that right right now. Um, I once taught at the University of Maryland School of Law, so I am delighted to uh, meet an alum. Um, and uh, I have a long bio, um, and I'm all I'm going to say that she was also awarded the Legislature of the Ye Legislator of the Year Award by the Maryland Access to Justice mm -hmm. Commission. Uh, Derek McCoy uh, serves as president of the Maryland Family Alliance and the Maryland Family Council. He's been an associate pastor at Hope Christian Church in Beltsville for 18 years. Um, uh, I want to mention this because it was in his bio. He mentions that he's been married to his girlfriend, Kathy, for 19 years. <laughs> and what a good way to put it. Uh, the rules are the same as the other panel. Uh, Three-minute opening statements, then I'll try to rotate back and forth with questions. Uh, both panelists can respond to whatever the other said, but the limit is three minutes. Someplace about 30 minutes into the conversation, we'll take questions from the audience, and then um, we'll have closing statements. Uh, Delegate DeMay, you're first. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the kind introduction. And I'd also obviously like to thank Nancy and the League for hosting the forum, um, and thank the League also for their important work throughout the election process, and actually throughout the whole year. Obviously, we rely on the League of Women Voters for many educational forums um, all the way through the um, year. Um, I, in preparing for this presentation, went back and reviewed my notes and materials from the legislative session. I serve on the House Judiciary Committee and actually serve as the vice chair of that committee, um, which is the committee that is uh, the jurisdiction for this bill that came through it. So during the last 10 years that I've served on the House Judiciary Committee, I've heard this bill over and over again and was delighted to see it finally pass. Um, but I was also particularly reviewing my notes from the debate um, this year on the floor of the House of Delegates, and I was very honored to actually serve as the floor leader on the House of Delegates. I also reread two appellate cases, Loving v. Virginia, the 1967 U.S. Supreme Court case that struck down Virginia's anti-miscegenation law, and Nam v. Nam, a 1955 Virginia Court of um, a Supreme Court case that was cited in the Loving case. The Nam case was when a Chinese man married a white woman, and the, they went to North Carolina to get married because in Virginia their marriage wouldn't have been allowed. And the S Supreme Court of Virginia upheld that law in 1955. And the language in that case was pretty harsh. It read, both sacred and secular history teach that nations and races have better advanced in human progress when they cultivate their own distinctive characteristics and culture and develop their own peculiar genius. That was written in 1955. It wasn't for another 12 years before the Virginia miscegenation law was overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court in Loving v. Virginia in 67. Maryland didn't get rid of our law until February 67. No one here thinks that the words in them express anything good. Um, and it's amazing how just a short time ago, something that we now find abhorrent was accepted. So I'm going to borrow something from one of my colleagues, Senator Jamie Raskin, who was the floor leader in the Senate. 
because the way he discussed this bill, I think, is very important. Every generation faces its own test. Every time presents its own moral and political challenge, and none of them are easy. We're all made uncomfortable by the clash of values between those demanding equal respect and recognition and freedom today and right now, and those who feel upset about the threat to a settled expectation of how we ought to live and the compromises with justice that we've made in the past. There's no escaping our choices in times like this. Question six is one of those questions. I think the Civil Marriage Protection Act is a 21st century act of toleration that reconciles the public right of every citizen to equal membership in society's institutions with the freedom of every religious organization to associate or every association of religious to keep their teachings and their theology. I look forward to our discussion this afternoon. I think that this is a balance of two things, and it protects religious freedom, but it does, in fact, grant equality and tolerance and civil rights to gay and lesbian couples. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pastor McCoy. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I say thank you for everybody enduring their Saturday. Uh, and. Uh, to hang in here and, and, and to have this discourse. This is great. Um, and as well, I thank uh, the, women, uh, the League of Women Voters for creating this as well. Um, and I like our moderator who has a very distinguished bow tie. Now, that being said, um, what we have done as far as the Maryland Marriage Alliance, we were created, and just let me help you understand, I understand this is a very controversial issue. I've been around the entire state talking about this. And uh, I could even say uh, the person who was sitting in my seat earlier, Delegate Mazur, we probably agree on something, which is not on this issue, but on question seven. So I guess we're in the right seat. But um, I, I would say this, in regarding this issue, the Maryland Marriage Alliance is not just a, uh, a group of organizations that are just from a religious perspective only. Really where we come from is we have deeply committed uh, beliefs about the good of marriage for society the union between a man and a woman, the, that marriage is a foundation of human family and a real building block for the common good and for society. When we begin to think about this, we're deeply committed to the welfare of every child and, and children regardless of his or her parent, parental status and we understand that very deeply. We understand that every parent or every family does not necessarily get the opportunity to afford the kids with the mom and the dad. However, we do understand that that is a good scenario for children and for raising generations. Every boy and girl deserves that ability to have that compassionate uh, family dynamic. Also, we're deeply committed to advocating for marriage between one man and one woman as a, po as a positive perspective, as also nonpartisan. And, and when you look at the Maryland Marriage Alliance of how we've kind of gathered, it crosses socioeconomic lines, it crosses racial lines, it crosses demographic lines, and it crosses a lot of lines. And so it's not just a thing where, well, this is just a group of people that from a religious tenant believe this. No, this is a group of people from many streams of society that believe that marriage is fundamental building block to, uh, to society. It's not a group of people that says they just want to have ostracized one portion or one group in society at all. Matter of fact, we believe just the opposite. We believe that we can love our gay and lesbian friends, family, colleagues, members, and we understand that. But we don't think we have to redefine the marriage and that word specifically. We also believe that we can People have the rights to live it so though they want to choose, but we don't have to redefine marriage. So we thank you for this opportunity to discuss this matter further. Well, thank you very much, Pastor McCoy. Um, you focused in your statement about the importance of marriage, um, and I think many Marylanders would agree, many Americans would agree, but marriage means many things to many people, and also marriage and families are not as strong as they once were. Mm -hmm. um, Shouldn't that give us some pause to say maybe there's room in the tent for alternative forms of marriage? Well, I mean, it's a great question. I don't think we've done a, the best jobs that we can do in terms of uh, marriage in general. I think uh, we got a lot of work to do. I think we need to build marriages. We need to establish healthy marriage plans. We need to tell the generations be even behind me that, you know what, you got to stick it out. You got to endure because marriage is a fundamental building block to society. I think with that being said, that doesn't necessarily say that we need to go back and say this plan hasn't worked, and now we need to go forward and redo marriages as we know it. I'm not opposed to affording rights and benefits and everything else that's there, and I think many le legislatures have worked on that. But I don't think um, 
taking folks from this perspective and saying, well, you believe that marriage is defined between one man and one woman fundamentally, and then saying, well, you really have no place in the public square to voice that opinion or, or have dialogue about it. And I think that's what you've seen with the thousands of people that have signed a petition, as well as the thousand people that, that, that have get engaged in this issue around the state and around the country. Uh, it's, a, it's a deep issue for a lot of people. Uh, Delegate uh, DeMay, on this issue of strengthening marriage, some argue that uh, expanding the definition or allowing same-sex marriages would strengthen marriage. Do you want to address that question? Sure. Um, and some of it goes to what are you defining? And I think one of the things that is very important to, to look at is this is a question of what is it that is being defined by the state? This is a question of the state is issuing a marriage license. And that is what this bill is about and is a question of what rights is the state granting. So we are suggesting that there are two individuals that want to be able to get a license to be married and want to be able to perhaps raise children, want to be able to live together. There, under federal law, there are over 1,100 rights that have been indicated that are defined. You have to be married to be granted over 1,100 rights under federal law. Um, if you are not married, you're not entitled to those 1,100 rights. And only if you're married do you get them. So when you're talking about a building block of a society, and you know, I do think that marriage can be a broader definition than simply one man and one woman. I don't think that you can only say that marriage can simply be with that. It can be a broader definition. Um, Pastor McCoy, it is the case that under federal law, I think inheritance, for example, and mm -hmm. inheritance taxes are a function of marital status. Correct. So without using that word, marriage, uh, a same-sex couple, when one of the partners passes away, faces a income tax liability. I'm just picking one out of 1,100. Mm -hmm. A liability that um, a married couple would not. How should we think about that issue? Well, I think there's a couple ways to think about it. One, um, the Maryland State Legislature has been very aggressive in terms of passing laws. and. Uh, and pertaining to domestic partnerships. And in current domestic partnerships, exemption from uh, state inheritance taxes are already currently included in there. That would also include same-sex couples. So I think y when you're looking at various laws that are passed, there are some things that have been passed to afford rights and benefits. And so, again, we're not at the position of saying, well, we need to uh, not allow for various laws. And I think there has been a lot of discussion, and <laughs> Delegate Toomey, uh, knows very clearly in terms of the Judiciary Committee and how intense this was this last session. Um, there were civil unions that were offered. There were a lot of different things offered in terms of trying to pass legislation that would make accommodations and make the, the right compromise to make would sure that Would your organization have been supportive of a civil union? Uh, yeah, at that time, yes, sir. And then I do ask the question, then I go back. Why not civil unions? Separate Separate but equal did work before, and it's not going to work now. And there are a couple of reasons. A civil union's not portable, and it's been shown because New Jersey had civil unions, and they've switched, and it's now marriage. Civil unions, I can have a civil union in marriage, or in Maryland. When I take it to another state, what does another state do with that? And a civil union in Maryland doesn't translate with federal law. It still doesn't grant me the, the 1,100 rights under the federal law. Um, even in Maryland, with when I've got a domestic partnership or I have a, we don't have civil unions, but I have a domestic partnership, it doesn't grant me the exemptions from the inheritance right under federal law. Um, so it doesn't allow me to file a joint tax return um, with a partner under federal law. Um, and in fact, because I can't file a joint tax return in, under federal law, I can't file a joint tax return under, with a marital status in Maryland. You know, so unfortunately, because the way our laws are structured, the word marriage or married is what we have at the moment. So establishing 
And as I said in my opening, creating some sort of new institution doesn't solve the problem. And again, it's, you know, if we go back to having a loving couple that wants to be able to live together, whether it's to have a family or just to be able to live together, work together, and build a relationship together, and want a state license that grants them rights under that a state and the government grants, that's the reason for the Civil Marriage Protection Act. At the same time, granting every religious organization the absolute protection not to have to acknowledge or in any way accept a same-sex couple. Well, you raised many points. I'm still Sorry. No, 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 <laughs> that's good, that's good. We're having a discussion here. Um, but let me just back up for a second. You said, and then I'll turn to Pastor McCoy on mm -hmm. the question of the churches and so forth and any other issues, uh, Pastor, that you want to address. But you, in effect, said, my goodness, we're forced to do this because the Fed, partly because the federal government has all these rules and we can't trigger the benefits. And I know you're a state legislator. But as I was listening to you, if I were a supporter of civil unions as opposed to same-sex mm -hmm. marriage, I would have said, well, then the answer is changing federal legislation to accommodate both points of view. And I'd like to ask you to address that for a moment, and then I'll <coughs> go back to Pastor McCoy. In other um, words, maybe the problem is the federal government. <laughs> and I oh, did I say, say that? Yeah, I, did say I was that. just going to say, did you really say that? And with the existing dysfunctional Congress that can't even pass a budget, we're going to get them to um, pass a civil union bill, or f of all things, actually get to the point where perhaps they d get rid of the Defense of Marriage Act, which I have to admit, just recently or th within the last week, there has been another um, federal um, district court that, in fact, indicated that they believe it's unconstitutional, and I would hope that the U.S. Supreme Court will s get that case with if you know within this year, I believe, and for we will see where that ends up. But that would be one way to solve that problem, um, but I doubt that we're going to see Congress address this, uh, and which is the reason why you're seeing it come up from the state levels. Uh, Pastor McCoy, there is an exception, an exemption. Religious institutions don't have to perform uh, same-sex marriages. Shouldn't that be enough? If I could address just a quick moment of on course. the federal issue and then come back yes, to that Yes, please, one. please do. Um, I think the federal issue, one of the things, I think you're right. I mean, this is a federal issue as, uh, on some of these very fundamental issues. But I think that also shows another reason in the state of Maryland, let's, let's make accommodations. Let's work on it. I think that's what the delegates have been doing and the, and the legislature has been doing for several years, year after year after year, passing legislation that affords rights and benefits. And that has been given. The other side, though, I think when you're looking at it as well from a federal standpoint, yeah, well, Bill Clinton signed into a law not that long ago, the Defense of Marriage Act. Now, we understand two districts, uh, the latest in New York, uh, has declared it unconstitutional. Well, it's going to be appealed, and it's consistently been appealed. That's why you keep getting these rulings. And we also know New York passed by legislative authority same-sex marriage. So the, where the courts are, you know, we have a system which I think everybody understands. you got to a left, a right, and whatever else in the middle. And to me, oftentimes I look at it as a very broken system. But um, nonetheless, when I think we are going to see a Supreme Court decision on this issue with very well within the next year. Within that next year, a couple of different decisions are going to come down. Whether, one, oh, this is, exact, this is unconstitutional across the country. That means every state that has voted on it 32 different times when millions of voters have voted on this issue and the fundamental definition, there will be tough luck. See you later. All the constitutional amendments will re be reversed and every, and every law and statute in the state. Now, Maryland has had a family code 2-201 that defined marriage between one man and one woman for quite some time, since the 70s. Now, they, what they did is they struck out a man and a woman and redefined it based on this bill. I think when we're looking at it, we understand that those are issues that we're going to have to face. And the Supreme Court, though, one of the other decisions that many people will think will be the likely decision is that they're going to say, this is a state's issue and the states need to decide this. Now, going to the religious issue very quickly, um, we, it's, it's one of those things that's kind of funny because I've talked to numerous clergy in various denominations. And one of those things where they said, well, um, thank you very much for giving us the rights that we already had in the First Amendment and of the Constitution. Not really sure, and I mean, we understand this one as well. 
those were written in a way <coughs> that would be savvy to churches to make them feel as though you won't be threatened and there won't be issues. At legal experts on all sides of this aisle say that there are real implications and issues. And I understand on, on both sides, people are really looking at this and saying, well, there are true issues. Now, if you look at Chick-fil-A and you look at other issues and, and other business entities, but even in the 501c3 category and churches, other organizations that are attached to churches, your modern day church today is not just a quick, uh, I would say one, you know, one building and a couple people. It's, it's, it's multiple million dollar facilities at times and, and different entities and a lot of things that are attached to it. Within that perspective, all of those different, some of those different organizations that are attached to that are not necessarily protected under the auspices of this bill. And I understand that. But I think the modern day person who is leading some of these religious organizations also understands that there are uh, unique threats to that issue. Well, we've implicated the uh, First Amendment. Um, how do you respond to the argument, and um, Delegate uh, uh, DeMay also made it, that this was the civil rights issue of the 21st century? Me? Yes, please. Oh, sir. no, that, oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but Del, you, can, you can respond to everybody. Right. Sure. That one I do with much pause um, because I'm keenly aware of civil rights and what that means for a lot of people. I know what it means for the fabric of my family and my generations and my history. I don't, I don't you know, go back and, and look at this in a very light manner. When we deal with the Loving versus Virginia case, we deal with the miscegenation laws, we deal with the racism that has, you know, been indicative in our country for quite some time. I think it's a terrible stain in the history of America. I think it's one of those things that have worked to separate the races and keep people apart from one another. When you deal with the Loving versus Virginia case as well, though, that was about the separation of races. It was not redefining marriage between a man and a woman. And I think you have to distinctly tease those out and understand that was the issue on those issues. Now, I'm, I'm a person that if, if it was Loving versus Virginia in today's time, I'd probably be working very vehemently on that issue and say, no, the races should be uh, connected and there should not be the bitterness of racism that holds us apart. I think if you say this is the modern day era of the, of the civil rights era today, you know, one thing that I will do and I, and I ask you to, and I, I think about it this way. I remember going into the South when I was a kid, when I grew up, I would go to the South quite a bit of times. My family just shipped me off. So you go down there and spend time with your cousins. My uncle um, was a university professor, which is a very good job in that day and time for somebody who was African American. When we That's would go- a good job for some people it, right well, now, right? Yes, sir, yeah. you're right, you're exactly right. Uh, phenomenal job back in that day. But I, I'll never forget walking down the street and being attacked at different times, things thrown at, uh, all sorts of different things happened to me. And, we, and my cousin would just put me on his arm and say, run with me, get, let's, we gotta get home. And it was because of the color of my skin. It wasn't anything else. It was the color of my skin and we had to get pr to protection. I think the civil rights era when they were, were turning hoses on people, when they were lynching folks in the South, when they were doing bitter things. And we also know in the other, in, in, in the other, other cultures, even in the Jewish culture, I was in Israel not too long ago, visited the Holocaust Museum. Terrible, tragic things were happening to people across this earth and, 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 and in our country. But again, when we go back to that, I look at that civil rights issue. I say, that does not necessarily equate, and many people in my culture say, well, you know what? There's, there's too much blood that was spilled. There's too, many, too much that went on that you can equate that to the modern day issue. And I think when you're looking at that, those are things that we need to understand with sensitivity, that some are offended by the issue, and, and really understand that, hey, this is, I don't, they would not equate it to the modern day civil rights issue of today. Definitely, Demay. I don't see how you cannot equate it to, as a, or talk about it in terms of a modern day civil rights issue. All you have to do is talk to some of the individuals that have experienced the prejudice and the discrimination um, when they have been gay or lesbian and have been n unable to be able to walk down the street and not feel the bigotry. And all you have to do is read the stories of the young individuals, particularly in high school, that have been bullied. And the horrible stories, granted, perhaps not as prevalent as all of the things that we read 
about the 60s and certainly what you must have experienced when you were, um, went to the South when you were younger. But it's not that we've not all read the stories about teenagers that were brutally beaten um, and recently beaten in cities because they were homosexual. So I do think it is the civil rights story. But on an up note, I also think that within a short period of time, all you have to do is talk to younger people. And I was, I didn't even know that my niece was in the galley when we were having the debate on the floor of the House of Delegates. And it is very, I'm the oldest of eight, I have 22 nieces and nephews, and even within my large family, we have our own debates and sort of levels of discussion on this issue. But I have to admit, the younger generation is the generation that sort of looks at this, and really, my 14-year-old niece that was, you know, I guess actually my 18-year-old niece was in the galley, and they went home and were talking about it with my 14-year-old niece, and really the attitude is, what's the big deal? If there are two people that love each other, why in the world can't they get married? So there is a different perspective, and I do think that we're going to see that. And I think at some point in time, whether it's a year from now, five years from now, or 10 years from now, it really, we are going to look back in some ways the way we look back at some of the horrible things that went on. And I don't disagree that there is still bigotry and prejudice on a racial level. It's very unfortunate that it still exists, but it does and we still think about it as being awful. But at the same time, we're gonna look back, I think, at some of the race, uh, not race, but the bigotry we see at gay and lesbians and think, how did that ever happen? And I hope we look back at the marriage issue at the same way, that why in the world was it ever an issue? But it is the civil rights issue of this country. Well, Kirsten McCoy, this raises, uh, I think, an important strategic question. I think most observers think that if this vote were taken, all things being equal, if this vote were taken 15 years from now, the generation that Delegate DeMay De is talking about, right, would say, what's the big deal? So do you think the added, do you think this is an accurate description of the attitudes of the coming generation? And do you think that will change? Because if it's an accurate, description of the attitudes of the younger generation. And if those attitudes won't change, then in the long run, gay marriage passes, right? No matter what. Well, there's no question. This debate has escalated at gargantuan proportions uh, just in the last five to 10 years. If you understand around our world, I mean, this, escal this is everywhere. And it is absolutely escalating consistently. Now I'll say this, it's amazing that it escalates so consistently. I think media has an amazing part to do with it because if, if you were to think today that, you know, really, did, and, and I wanna get to your question absolutely, but if you thought today, the general concept at times when I look at this, you would think that everybody is for this issue. Everybody should be voting for question six and everybody had, had really made up their decisions on this issue already but 32 times where it's gone before the vote of people millions of times, not, not, not years ago. We're talking about just a couple months ago in, in North Carolina and, and, and other places. So you're, you're just saying that they've consistently voted that there's something unique about marriage. There's something that should be, you know, preserved within our society. Now, you know, hear me, I don't think that was out of a heart of bitterness and or racist, racism, um, but I think that's out of a heart of deeply felt beliefs and understanding of what the societal value is to marriage. Now. Addressing the issue about the, the, the younger generation, I would be absolutely ludicrous to say you don't see polls and see people saying, well, the younger generation is going this way. I do believe a lot of younger people are saying that, you know what, what is the big deal? But I think at the same time, I'm a dad of three kids. There's no way in the world that I'm gonna say, what's the big deal, and not have a discussion with them and help them understand the fundamental belief about what marriage really means. What it means because I want them to stick it out during their tenure, their time, I understand a lot of different issues, and some people say, well, you know, how can you be such a father? Well, I'm trying to produce engaged citizens in our culture and our community. Perhaps it will run for office and, and help lead this world. Now, regardless whether you like my opinion or not, that's what I'm doing. And I think there are a lot of people that are doing very similar things in terms of their own kids, their own generations that come. I think also, 
one thing that we definitely see in the statistics, not just that everybody's there, but also as they get older, as they begin to make life decisions in terms of getting married, they begin to change their perspective on this issue very clearly. It's not an issue where it's a done deal. It's an issue where people begin to think, well, you know, as I'm young and I'm free and I'm rolling, I'm not necessarily married. Yeah, they got a lot of who cares. But at the same time, as soon as they start to make key life decisions, they start to think about it a little bit more and say, hmm, I got kids, I have a family, what do I want that building block to look like? And those decisions are not the same in terms of uh, the numbers. You know, I want to give you an opportunity. I have a question for you, as well, but I wonder whether you want to respond at all to what Pastor McCoy said. Uh, I actually do, and, and I disagree. I think that as, and again, it is all in perspective, but I actually think it is how you look at marriage um, and what you define it as. You know, it is what I'm asking of the state, what I'm asking of the government. If I'm asking the state for a marriage license, it is a question of what rights am I asking from the state. It is not what I'm asking of my church. Um, and if I, you know, if I happen to be Roman Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church and the sacrament of marriage in the Roman Catholic Church is not going to accept a same-sex marriage. Um, and I, this law is not going to make them accept it. Um, and there's, I can't see at any time in the foreseeable future that the <laughs> Roman Catholic Church is going to. Um, but if I fr have friends that want to get married and they want a marriage license, they want to get state rights, they should be entitled to be able to be married in the state of Maryland um, or in whatever state in this country they want to get married in. Uh, and th what they want to do from a religious perspective is their personal opinion and personal right. But no one should be denied rights granted by our governments. And that is really, I think, the crux of what this legislation is about. It ha but then again, when you're talking about, which you have made very clear, the building blocks of society, I do think that having two individuals create a family or create a relationship and live together and want to sort of form the building block of society, whether or not they are heterosexual or same sex, I think that is building a good community. And if they are entitled to the same rights that they're they, from the state that I am, and it really doesn't make a difference whether it's called marriage, civil union, except for the fact that again, from a perspective of granting everyone the same rights, civil unions don't work, separate but equal didn't work before, it's not gonna work now, it's not portable from one state to the other, and that's the reason why the Civil Marriage Protection Act is something that I hope everyone here will vote for. I couldn't tell from your body language, Pastor, if you wanted to say something in response. I did, but maybe I'll loop that into your next question. No, go ahead. <laughs> I'd rather you answer my next question, so you go ahead. <laughs> Well, I, I, you know, I don't really see this as a separate but equal issue. Now, maybe I'm just very naive, but, and I'm sure probably some have murmured and said, absolutely. But um, I think there are millions of thinking citizens across this country who think about it at a very fundamental level. Now, when we begin to look at the concept of saying, is this, you know, I, I, and, I, and I respect Delegate um, Dumay in terms of thinking about it and say, well, it's when people have walked down the street, they've been discriminated against being gay and lesbian. And I, I, I get that, but I guess one of the things I think about, when I walk down the street in Silver Spring, when I walk down the street in Bethesda, and I'm in this community all the time, my kids go to school in the community, we understand this very deeply, but I, I don't discriminate against anybody when I'm walking down the street. I don't hit them upside the head and say, ah, you look this way, or you're this, I really don't know if somebody's gay or lesbian or not, I really don't. Never ask the question, don't really do it. If I'm engaging them in a, if I'm for services or whatever else may be the case, we engage them for services. You know, if you're going to a business, you're, hey, do you have this product? I mean, look at the Chick-fil-A. Hey, do you have good waffle fries? Absolutely, I enjoy waffle fries. But I think when you begin to understand within the concepts of our society, what is, what is taking place, that there has to be, this, this is a fundamental uh, issue here, where we're dealing with the fundamental definition of what marriage is about. And on one end of the stick, it's saying this is a government or civil issue. Well, the Civil Marriage Protection Act 
does what it does is actually say, take out a man and a woman and put in any two individuals. It says gays and lesbians can marry. Okay, that's fine. But government never created marriage. It, it, would, it predated, marriage predated government. They got around something that was actually good and said this is a good thing for society and, and kind of codified it within our governmental ranks. So to say that now we're discriminating against people that are walking down the street that are gay and lesbian, that's, that's a separate issue. But I don't see that happening every day. And I do understand there are instances and cases. There are instances and cases of people still getting, you know, uh, 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 discriminated against from being African American, discriminated against from being Latino, discriminated against from whatever else may be the case. We could talk about immigration, immigration here, and it would be a whole nother scene. But we need to understand that we do have difference of opinions on this, no question about it. But I think when we're looking at it, there is not a heart or a thread or a seed to say this is a discrimination issue. And I think what has taken place is it's a, a slight move to say, well, are you going to be on the wrong side of history or not, whatever else may be the case from the past of the civil rights issue. Well, African Americans were struggling to be counted as a, as a one full person from the years ago from slavery. They were three-fifths of a person. They counted to be trying to work to be one person. And so within the ranks of our government being identified that way. And I look at it, that was because of an immutable characteristic of their skin tone, uh, their skin and, and a lot of other issues. And I could really see that as, a, again, a tough part of history. But we don't carry that on our sh shoulder. And uh, again, the sign says stop. <laughs> uh, it's about time to turn to the audience for questions. But I have one last question before that I want to bring us down to ground level here. And I want to talk about what the pollsters call the Tom Bradley effect. Okay. Um, the Tom Bradley effect, Tom was running for governor of the state of California. And the polls said he was going to win. And he went down to defeat. He was an African American. And the consensus was people didn't want to say they were voting against him. Um, Same-sex marriage provisions have never passed in a referendum anywhere in the country, including right. in California. Right. Um, the referent the, the ballot measure seems to be in the positive range right now. The Washington Post uh, reports that if the election were today, uh, if the vote were today, it would pass. Um, I'd like to ask you, Delegate, what do you think, do you think there's a Tom Bradley effect sitting behind this story? That's what happened in California. Hmm. I actually don't, um, and partly because I do think that the tide is, has turned, um, and I think that the momentum is such that the education has started, that people have, you know, more and more people know, or their na their next door neighbor, you know, is a, you know, two father, a couple with two fathers, um, or their niece is, you know, gay and, you know, got married in Washington State, or, you know, not Washington State, I guess, but got married in D.C. And, you know, it's, it's become more known, and more and more people know, you know, a gay couple that has children, um, or know a couple that have just been together for 40 years and didn't realize that, gee, they're actually gay, a gay couple, and they've been together, and there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to get married, and that they shouldn't be able to own a house together, tenant by the entirety, um, and that they shouldn't be able to enjoy the inheritance rights that a married couple owns. So that, you know, as the education comes out and people begin to understand what it means to have the legal rights to be married, and that it is not a threat against a religious institution and the religious perspective rights under that um, a religious institution can grant to a uh, marriage. I do think that it is not going to be a Tom Brady effect. Question for you? No Tom question. Bradley? Absolutely. There's no question about it. Um, we've seen this historically, even in North Carolina uh, back in April, they were, uh, they were talking about an upset. And this is the first place 
in North Carolina that, that was going to be doing Yes, they did. And when, when they saw that, I mean, this was reported in the newspapers. And so some of the pollsters said it. Matter of fact, PPP poll was one of the guys that said, hey, um, you know, I think this is going to be the first state that actually votes it down by voter people. 61% of the people voted for marriage being defined between one man and one woman. That was out of PPP polls, uh, owners' own uh, perspective. So I think you do have a resonant people because, let me, the reason why, people do not want to feel like they're being unfair. People do not want to be put their finger on and say, this is, a, a, I'm against equality, I'm against justice, I'm, I'm merciless, you know what I'm saying? And, and you just think you're mean or you're a hater, whatever else would be the case. People don't want to be feel like that way. I mean, I got people that names were published in a petition, um, and if you look at this, names were published in a petition by the blade. Okay, well, when they were published in a petition, you got people knocking on people's doors. Hey, why did you do this? You're voting against me. Duh, don't do this. I think those are the kinds of things that are to strike as intimidation with people say, that's not good. And I think we all need to understand there's a civil discourse that we need to have. If you understand the Chick-fil-A issue, you got a, you got a guy who said, hey, here, here's what I think about marriage. And immediately, I mean, the country was almost flipped up and upside down off a of chicken and basically saying, hey, you shouldn't voice that kind of opinion. You're, you're a hater. I mean, it, you got stuff called taste like hate and all this kind of things. The, the Chicago uh, folks are saying you shouldn't even build in our city. Mayor Vincent Gray saying, you know what, you really have no place in our city. All of these kinds of things are happening that, are, that feel as though they're intimidation, regardless whether you think, or, think about them or not. You got Dr. McCatskill, who put, signed a petition. As soon as she signed a petition, she's out there, and she was suspended from her job. Never even asked by a president saying, hey, what do you think about this issue? What, what's the issue right now? I know you're chief diversity officer, but can you tell us why you signed the petition? No, just immediately suspended. Why? Because uh, the lesbian couple who was there put it in front of the president and said, you need to get rid of her. I mean, you know, and this is what Dr. McCaskill said in her own public press conference, not what I'm saying. So if you look up the information, you can listen to it. But I think it's one of those things where there is an un understanding right now, a Vermont innkeeper case, where you look at it, they asked for to do a same-sex uh, wedding, and the law had changed there. They got fined by 10th. They said, you know, uh, we don't want to do that. But um, they, they, the Vermont innkeeper actually said they would do it. Um, they were filed with a discrimination charge, $10,000 fine against human rights campaign. They had to do 20000 with the people, and then they said they would never even do a wedding in their inn at all. So those kinds of issues are happening in our society today, which you got to figure out if this law changes and if this continues, where do the people go that believe that marriage is fundamentally between one man and one woman, and where do you go on the other side? Um, if you have a question, raise your hand in the front row, Nancy. Hi, I'm Lucy Freeman, and I have a question for Pastor McCoy. Uh, when you talk about marriage and a, f a couple and a family, I'd like to use a, ex an example. My cousin, he and his husband have been together now for 40 years. They raised my cousin's child. They live in Portland. They go down to California for all the grandparent days. They, my cousin's husband was very sick, and so Scott took care of him. So they have been through everything in the marriage vows together. So why can't this couple be considered a family, a couple in marriage? I think they have been considered a family yeah. and they have been considered a couple. I think we're asking about the definition of marriage and that's a little bit different issue. I mean, nobody has ever stopped them from doing what they've done over the course of time and the, the course of history. And I, and I hear your heart, I really do, and I understand they are probably deeply held beliefs with each one of them about what they believe and what they've done in society. And I get it. Washington's actually got the same measure on the ballot. So, you know, we'll see how it goes after the, the ref, uh, after November 6th there. But I think it's the issue where we're just saying we probably fundamentally disagree about the name of marriage and the word marriage. And, but at the same time, we're not telling anybody that they can't love who they want to love or they can't be with whoever we want to be with. That's, that's, that's society. That's democracy. You could do that today with anybody you want. In our current law, we have restrictions on certain things within the fundamentals of marriage. Being said, hey, look, grandfather can't marry granddaughter. There's a lot of things of who you cannot marry within the confines of the law today and saying that just does not work. And so we're, we're still limiting their love as well. And we have people that say we love each other. Another question to Pastor McCoy, and I say this with respect and, and in friendship. I have a strong marriage. You said that you have a strong marriage. We both know people who have marriages that are not so good. 
sure. because of domestic violence or, or something else, their marriage doesn't affect yours and doesn't affect mine, just as yours and mine don't affect each other. But yet, it means a lot to me to be able to be married, as I'm sure it does to you. And kind of a second uh, thread here, this talk, you, you made the comment today that marriage predated government, and I assume that was kind of a reference to religion and to God. We know from the Bible that religion, excuse me, that marriage was defined very differently. In the Bible, marriage is between one man and as many women as he can afford. <laughs> so my, my fundamental question, and, and, and I hope you'll think about it and others who have the, the position that you have will think about, can't we have some charity to people who want to be married as much as you and I want to be married, but who are different from us, who, who view marriage differently than you and I do? And their marriage won't affect us and won't affect anybody else. Why not let them have what they want so desperately because it won't affect us or anybody else who's married the way we are? I'm going to intervene here because of the Time. I'm going to let Pastor McCoy answer that, but after the next question, if that's all right. Oh, no problem. I, the, I, Go ahead. I, Go didn't, ahead. I didn't really hear a question. I mean, that's fine. I, yeah, and yeah, I, and I just I took it as a, a statement. Yeah, respectful statement, and so I, I get it. We're, we're going to take yes, one sir. more question, and then we're going to do summing up. Sure. And I think um, that would be a good point. Stephen Schwartz, maybe this question will sum everything up. Uh, there are many fundamental churches out there that are strongly opposed to question six. So my question is, how can you get these churches to see the positive side to question six as well as the negative side? Let's assume that that first question is uh, to delegate to May, to May <laughs> because <laughs> that's her objective. Um, I do think that it's an evolution. Um, and I mean, I will tell you, you know, if you'd asked me the question by way of example, 15 or 20 years ago, I'm not so sure that I would have been there, which I find surprising based on where I am today. And, you know, can't believe that I wouldn't have seen it even that many years ago. So it's an evolution. And I think it's really a matter of just, we keep talking about it. You keep having conversations and you keep having conversations really one-on-one. -on -one. That's the way we make the change. I don't see any more hands up. <coughs> Let's do closing statements. Sure. About three minutes each. And um, Pastor McCrory, why don't you go first? No problem. First, I'll say that you, <coughs> your, your timer is excellent. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I understand that this was one of those issues that many people have a lot of different beliefs and perspectives on. I get that. I, I, I go around and talk about this on a regular basis and I get that, hey look, people just disagree and they see it differently. I think though our country and even our state right now, the reason why it's on referendum is because thousands of people have been engaged in this process to say, look, they believe in marriage. They believe in the fundamental definition of it regardless of what you think about it. And I think they are going to be here in Maryland after November 6th. So any way that this splits doesn't really make a difference. We still gotta be here afterwards. And I would just say, in, in terms of looking at this, and when you're looking at understanding, to me, marriage is more than about just what any two adults want, but it's about the future and generations. It's a fundamental building block, and I've said it over and over again, and I know they've repeated my statements, but I do believe it's a fundamental building block to society. And I think, you know, when, when even I'm, at, I'm posed with the question of understanding, hey, could I be more open-minded about this issue? Yeah, sure, I'm, I, I, trust me, I've thought about this, I've really considered a lot of different perspectives. I've asked myself the question, how do you think about this? What would you do in these situations? And really to try to think beyond what my, my own shell of thinking would be. Had discussions with a whole lot of other people, had discussions with the gay community and, and others on, on a lot of these issues and tried to really get a perspective. I also understand though, I gotta have these discussions with my own kids and other kids and other people that are in our communities together collectively. And as I've had those, I still come up with the simple thing of, you know what? Marriage is a unique, a unique institution that I never defined in the first place. And I think it's just one of those things that for me, at this moment in my life, that I do believe it's between man and woman. And regardless of other people's perspective, I get it. But I think tolerance is a perspective on this whole aspect and our, our 
our freedom of speech, our religious liberties, as well as the definition, are all things that should be considered when you're dealing with this topic of marriage. And I believe that, you know, for me, I encourage you to vote against question six. Thank you very much. Delegate? Thank you. Um, it's, as I indicated when I started, um, I've served on the House Judiciary Committee for 10 years. And this bill, or some variation of it, um, as well as sort of the counterpart, uh, we've had a constitutional amendment proposed to sort of make marriage in our Maryland Constitution be only between a man and a woman, has also been before my committee for the past 10 years. So the testimony on those bills usually goes for, and we usually hear them sort of at the same time and then hear sort of the proponents of civil marriage and the opponents for an hour each. We usually sit and listen to the testimony for at least 10 to 11 hours each year. They're long hearings, but I will tell you I do sit and I listen to all of them each year. It is amazing, sometimes it's the same, some of the same people, but many times it's different. But it is truly inspiring to hear the families that come to talk about their relationships. This year, it was two committees, not just the Judiciary Committee, it was also the Health and Government Operations Committee. And what was really inspiring was to watch the members of the Health and Government Operations Committee that had not listened to this testimony for 11 hours previously, and to watch their reaction. It's not that I was immune, because I do certainly find it heart heart rendering to, or heart rendering to listen to the testimony each year, but to watch some of my colleagues who had not heard it and to see their reactions and to actually watch some of their minds get changed, or at least if their minds weren't changed, to really see them begin to see the other side and to begin to think, I think I'm, I'm understanding why marriage makes a difference, and it is not just an emotional piece. There is a legal argument here. There is a reason why marriage makes a difference, and there, are, there is another way to look at marriage in the community. So I am hoping that um, question six passes. Um, I do think this is an opportunity for Maryland to show America the way to democratic freedom, and it's going to be a way to do it without a court forcing us to do anything. It's without us inventing a new institution, and it's without us infringing on the rights of any religious bodies um, that dissent from the perspective of having civil marriage. So I hope that you will vote for question six. Thank you. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the League of Women Voters of the State of Maryland and the University of Maryland School of Public Policy and the Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation, um, I want to say thank you to both of our uh, panelists, Pastor McCoy, uh, Delegate DeMay, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for uh, helping us understand a very difficult issue. And uh, we will see you on Election Day. Yes, we will. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>